you think about it, this problem of self-fulfilling prophe uh, prophecy would mean that right now, India and Pakistan would both be justified in launching a preventive war against each other. Eritrea and Ethiopia, Israel and Iran, North Korea and Japan, they would all be justified in launching preventive wars against each other. Uh, Congo and Rwanda. And I'll just leave you to answer for yourselves the question about the United States and Russia. Okay, now, here's my last reason for rejecting the broad permission to prevent, for preventive war. The first three reasons that I gave, uh, um, too many wars, judgment too screwy, self-fulfilling prophecy, all of that is under the assumption that states are acting in good faith. But states don't always act in good faith. They don't always make judgments in good faith. And the permissive rule would simply give cover to a state that wants to launch a war claiming prevention uh, when it's not necessarily acting in good faith. And of course, there was a lot of debate about whether that described our behavior in the Iraq war. There was one very famous uh, moment when uh, the head of the British intelligence, MI6, came to Washington uh, a few months before the war, um, had high-level discussions, went back to Downing Street, and made a report that eventually got leaked that said, um, I've been talking to officials in Washington, and the intelligence and the facts are being fixed around the policy of invading Iraq. The intelligence and the facts were being fixed. Uh, now, does that mean that we ought to completely reject the idea of anticipatory self-defense? Actually not. Uh, my own view is actually not that far, as I mentioned before, from the Bush Doctrine and from Vattel. And I think under narrowly circumscribed conditions, uh, it, a state can be justified in launching an anticipatory attack. And let me talk about what those conditions are. Uh, the first is that the threat that it's facing is really an existential threat, or something close to an existential threat. A threat, and here, here's what I mean, a threat that uh, uh, is a threat of mass casualties if we allow even a single attack. Uh, a threat against the basic human rights of the population of the homeland. Okay, not a threat to economic interests abroad, that's not good enough. But a threat um, that, that has to be forestalled from maturing even once. And that means weapons of mass destruction. And it means not just any kind of unconventional weapon, but I really mean mass destruction. Uh, nuclear weapons or the kind of biological weapon that could cause a mass epidemic. Something in which you can't afford to take the hit. Okay, now, the second condition um, is not just that that's the nature of the threat, but um, that the, the target state is, I'm going to use the abbreviation as a rogue state. And let me spell out a little bit what I mean by that. First of all, that its official rhetoric is blatantly militaristic. I mean, here you might think North Korea as an example of a state that doesn't try to pretty things up, that simply has a militaristic rhetoric. Secondly, that it actually is backing its militaristic rhetoric, um, its words, with action. Now, I think this is important, and I think it's very important in thinking about Iran. We know that uh, under the, the last president, uh, Ahmadinejad, there was a lot of genocidal rhetoric that was pouring out of uh, the Iranian government, which is, it's not pouring out anymore. But if you actually look at Iran's actions over the last couple of decades, they've been behaving uh, like uh, rational actor theory would predict. I mean, they haven't done it. They've, they've talked crazy talk, but they haven't done anything crazy. Um, they've done things that, uh, from the point of view of the Israelis, are very dangerous, the arming of Hezbollah, and coming to the brink of building a nuclear weapon. But they've always stepped back from the brink. And I think that rational actor strategy says that they're in the sweet spot if they don't build a bomb. If they're always on the verge of building a bomb, they get maximum leverage, but if they don't actually build it, then they don't get attacked. 
So uh, uh, they're behaving like rational actors. And so from my point of view, they don't satisfy the criteria that would justify an anticipatory attack right now. Uh, now, we also have to have credible intelligence that the leadership of that state actually has uh, some kind of at least contingency plans for launching the first strike or to give weapons to terrorists. Um, and finally, of course, the other conditions of just war have to be met, um, that the anticipatory self-defense um, is the last resort. More about that in a second. That the damage that it would inflict is proportionate to the damage that it aims to forestall. Um, that, uh, uh, and that means that you have to also take into account the possibility that the conflict might escalate, that there's a reasonable chance of success. Uh, those are the other just war criteria. Let's just think for a moment about uh, the criterion of last resort. That's the trickiest one, I think, in the context of preventive war. Because remember that what we're talking about with preventive war isn't imminence. It's an immature threat. So almost by the very definition of the topic, uh, it's not the launching an armed attack isn't a last resort. Um, there are always going to be some gap of time before that threat matures further. So one way to refine that is um, to say that last resort might mean, in the case of an otherwise justifiable preventive attack, um, that it's the last clear opportunity to do it, and here the you know, the analogy might be this: you know, suppose that you have a hostage situation in you know, civilian life, and a police SWAT team that has this hostage situation surrounded, and the the hostage taker actually has an arm around somebody's neck and a gun pointed at their head, and steps away for a second. This might be the last clear shot that enables the um, sniper to take out the hostage taker without endangering the victim. So even though the hostage taker's um, threat hasn't matured, this is, not the last, this is the last resort in the sense that it could very well be the last clear opportunity. And I think that you have to clarify the notion of last resort to something like that. Okay, so it, let me just summarize then. Uh, what, I, what I've been trying to argue is, uh, first of all, the idea that uh, preventive war has a historical pedigree, but that World War II changed everything, and that in the post-World War II, in the UN era, uh, we've dramatically narrowed the notion of just cause to uh, only to something like self-defense. Second, that a generalized principle of preventive war, of the Gentili sort, is something that we shouldn't accept. Um, and that's for the four reasons that I gave. And also doubling back to the start of my talk, just think about the examples that it would justify. Think about Pearl Harbor. Think about the Nazis going into Norway. Think about Russia going into Crimea right now. Do you want to justify all those attacks? They all would be justified under a generalized principle of preventive war. But finally, that uh, there is a justification for preventive war if you're facing a truly existential threat and attack by a rogue state with weapons of mass destruction and uh, have sufficient, sufficient intelligence and that this probabilistic test is met, um, that, uh, that the costs of the attack are very high and the probability is sufficient. Now, uh, obviously, I'm not going to put numbers on that. The answer isn't going to be 15% or 30%. But I think that one last caution that we have to have is uh, we live in a, an inherently risky world. The idea that we could ever reduce risks to zero and that that should be the goal so that uh, we are always entitled to launch prevention if, uh, if our risks aren't zero or near zero, that's an illusion. And it's an illusion that we, I think, really ought to put behind us. So at this point, let me just stop and uh, let the commentators uh, join in the conversation. Thank you.
Schoenhoven. Thank you, Dr. Luban, and thank you for the punctuality of that talk. I appreciate that. <laughs> won't happen with you. I'll do my best, actually. Well, first, I'd like to start by thanking um, Mark Wilson, Mark Dorley, and indeed Villanova University for having us all here for hosting what already has been, and no doubt in just over 10 minutes will once again be an excellent conference. Um, <laughs> I'd also like to thank Professor Lubin for the opportunity to comment on his paper, although I might complain a bit about the opportunity. Um, on the van ride in this morning, my colleagues from West Point, a rather churlish lot, were making fun of me because of the difficulty inherent in commenting on a paper with which one largely agrees. Um, I think that the consensus was I should probably just politely gesture to Professor Luban, say what he said, and sit down. <laughs> and there's almost no doubt that that would be better. But um, I think Villanova might feel like they're not getting their money worth, so there's not much left to do but quibble, right? And thankfully, I'm a philosopher. Quibbling is what we do. We're good at it. Um, it doesn't necessarily endear us to our spouses or it turns out to traffic cops, but it does keep us off the streets. Um, so I should say I'm sympathetic not only to the, many of the conclusions that Professor Lubin comes to, but also to some of the methodology that he uses to get there. Um, in his published work, he identifies his approach as broadly rule utilitarian, and that's an approach that I find quite congenial. Um, I am some sort of utilitarian on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays anyway. Um, Tuesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays, I'm a Kantian, and of course on Sundays, it's divine command theory. Um, and by the way, for all the U USMA cadets in the audience, if you don't really know, if you're not comfortable right now with um, what rule utilitarianism is, then immediately upon your return to West Point, you should contact your PY21 instructor and demand your money back. <laughs> Unless, of course, you're my student, in which case it's your fault anyway, <laughs> and I don't give refunds. Um, so. Let the quibbling begin. The obvious place to begin with any sort of rule utilitarian view is to ask whether it draws the line in the right places, whether it's too permissive or too restrictive. Um, and that's the approach I, I'm going to adopt, but I'm also going to raise a few more sort of general issues. And I'm asking how it, Professor Lubin's proposal fits in with other views that he um, seems to hold. So Professor Lubin um, does not enforce a general rule allowing preventive war, but he does allow a more restrictive permission, um, limited to rogue states. Um, there's, a gen, there's a genuine word here about, about weapons of mass destruction. And in his published work, at least, he has a further condition that this right be non-proxyable. That is, that states not be allowed to invite others to fight a preventive war on their behalf. Um, his initial characterization of preemption of preventive war is as a sort of a, a preemptive war with a relaxed imminence condition, right? Um, the notion of imminence is recast in probabilistic as opposed to temporal terms. Um, now, one worry we might have is whether if the threat is distant, this is something Professor Lubin just addressed, we could ever achieve the requisite level of moral certainty. Um, presumably the bar would have to be pretty high we're not going to proliferate wars, but that's not actually going to be the focus of my worry. Um, it seems to me that in life we have to make these sorts of prognostications all the time. He pays your money and he takes your chances. Um, it is, by the way, side note, it's tempting, and I think a number of authors have been tempted to suppose that um, maybe the temporal imminence condition was always just a stand-in for the probabilistic certainty condition. That really, um, I, the idea here is if you can see the attack coming, you're pretty sure that it's coming, right? And so it really was always this, this relative certainty that was doing the work. Um, I don't know whether that's true. It's hard to think of a case where you'd have um, temporal imminence without probabilistic imminence. The only one I can come up with is, I mean, suppose we have some wackadoodle dictator somewhere who announces that based on the outcome of some bizarre game of chance, there's a one in 1,000 chance that he will attack country X tomorrow. Um, does country X then, under those conditions, get to launch a preventive war? Um, I don't have a clue, actually. My intuitions aren't firm here, and that's actually a point I'm going to come back to in a bit. Um, but partly, part of the reason they're, they're infirm, I think, is, part, is they're probably queered by the fact that this guy's clearly crazy anyway. Um, so at any rate, I want to agree with Professor Luban that too broad a permission is a very bad idea. And so I, I want to quickly look at um, his restrictions. And in fact, I'm going to unfairly focus on this restriction. He didn't specifically mention this, this notion that preventive war might not be, ought not be proxyable. Um, his worry, as I understand it, is that 
look, this is an invitation to abuse. It gives large countries who want to fight a war the opportunity to pressure small countries to sort of invite them in on their behalf and launch unjust wars. Um, that strikes me as a real danger, but it's not obvious to me that still the right not, might not be proxyable. Um, let's see, I mean, in the personal sphere, um, if I knew I was going to be attacked, wouldn't I have the right to invite somebody in to help me prevent the attack? I mean, if I were certain it were going to come and it was an unjust attack, and wouldn't they, in fact, have at least a permission to help me? Um, and in the international sphere, the matter is complicated if we think in terms of weapons of mass destruction. Those are something that every nation has an interest in um, preventing. So even if I'm not likely to be the target of the attack, I might still. Thank you. I think this goes to show us that the problem with preventive evacuations is that the fire is neither imminent nor certain. And with that, we'll let our comment continue. And we'll be ending the session at 10.40, so we'll have time to finish up. Thank you. Thank you. I, I was tempted to just mention that the rest of my remarks were stunningly brilliant and, and see the rest of my time. But again, I don't know the problem with getting their money's worth. So let me just, I'll try to make this fairly quick. Um, so I was talking about this, this um, restriction that Professor Lubeck places, and I don't even know whether he still still stick by it, but that the idea that the, um, the right to fight, fight a preventive war not be proxyable. Um, and as I say, Professor Lubeck argues that that would lead to too many abuses. Now, that might be true, but it's not obvious to me. And it's, it seems to me that in any case where I could achieve the requisite level of certainty to be justified in launching preventive war, I'd have to have an awful, awful lot of evidence, right? So there couldn't be a shortage of evidence. Um, and ex hypothesis of preventive war, the attack is not imminent, so there's plenty of time. So one might actually be tempted in somewhat the opposite direction and to impose a requirement that third parties, in some sense, be involved. That is, that this is a move towards multilateralism, right? Um, we're all fail aware of the failure of organizations like the United Nations, um, but it does seem that in any case where there's that much time and that much evidence, um, that if I can't convince others of the justice of my cause, then probably I ought not fight. Um, so which is the better rule, right? Which will prevent more wars? Professor Lubin can point out that apparently it's not that difficult to build a coalition of the willing, even to fight wars that might strike us as unjust. Um, and so who's right? Um, notice, though, I'm actually going to shift my focus a little bit. The question of which rule will, will lead to fewer wars being fought isn't quite the same question as the question of which rule will avoid wars that intuitively ought not be fought. fought. Um, indeed, it seems possible that the two questions can come apart, that a rule designed to minimize the total number of wars might sanction intuitively unjust wars. Um, to state a, a rather bland, but I, I think sometimes rest of underemphasized fact, rule utilitarianism, like any consequentialism, is beholden to the empirical facts. Right? Um, none of us gets to say sort of, you know, what the outcomes will be. Um, I'm thinking here, Dick Brandt in a famous paper from earlier in the, from the 1970s, tries to derive the rules of use and bellow from rule utilitarian considerations, and, you know, rather famously fails, although I don't think he considers it a failure, to derive quite as robust a notion of non-combatant immunity as the just war tradition has, has usually held. Um, now, on the one hand, this is kind of the well-known instability of rule utilitarianism, right? That it's apparently always possible to envision a violation of the rule that garners us better results. But I think it can also be recast as a way that rule utilitarianism might just not give us all that we want. Um, we all have conflicting moral intuitions, and it's hard, maybe even impossible, to bring them all under a single overarching ethical theory. Maybe we don't have to. But there might be meta-ethical pressure to do so, and certainly we can't go all the way to the other extreme and just pick and choose whatever moral theory we want to give us the answer we want. Um, that is to abandon theory altogether. So I don't know how thorough, go thorough going Professor Lubin wants to be in his rule utilitarianism. He admits that he's not a thorough going consequentialist. But we do have to be alive to the possibility that even a moderately thorough going consequentialism might not deliver um, all the answers we antecedently want. Now, 
as a, as a case in point of that, I, I take, I, I want to mention an objection that's been raised to Professor Lubin's um, argument. It's called the rights objection. Um, and I, I'm going to try to just sort of sharpen it ever so slightly. The idea here is that the war, the preventive war, will trample on the rights of people who haven't actually done anything yet. Right? They haven't actually committed a crime yet. They haven't actually violated anyone's rights. So they have not made themselves liable to being attacked. Um, now, Professor Lubin's response to this is to assimilate their activities to the crime of conspiracy right? and say that in the first place, these people are guilty of having done something. They've created an emerging threat. Um, and second of all, that all wars necessarily involve trampling on somebody's rights. That is, it's impossible to fight a war without violating someone's rights. And so um, if we're not going to be pacifists, this is something that we sim up with which we simply must put. I am in the Department of English and Philosophy, after all. Um, so Professor Lubin says that, um, let's see, that a legitimate preventive war is no worse off in this respect than any other. I'm not myself yet convinced of this, though. Um, that one might as well hang for a sheep as a lamb might well be a counsel of prudence, but it's hardly a moral principle, especially not if stealing a, a sheep is objectively worse than stealing a lamb. And while war might necessarily involve the violation of rights, surely it matters whose rights are violated and how those rights are violated. I think we still want to hold on to a principle of discrimination, and I think that there's still something to the idea found in the doctrine of double effect that there's a difference between the harms we inflict intentionally and those we inflict unintentionally on others. So my worry here is that the hammer of preventive war will fall hardest on those who are actually not responsible, even for the emerging threat. Um, Professor Lubin identifies the crime that makes the adversary in preventive war morally liable to military attacks as a form of conspiracy. Um, but the activities that normally constitute this, Professor Lubin mentions activities such as purchasing aluminum tubes, building a nuclear reactor, hiring smallpox researchers, et cetera. These are not in general carried out by those who will bear the brunt of the military attack, that is to say, the military. Now, and Professor Lubin does claim that those in the military are vulnerable to attack in virtue of wearing the uniform, for this signals their commitment to what he calls the war project. Um, there's no doubt this is true in war, but I'm not sure about whether, to the extent to which it's true in peacetime. Um, I grant that military personnel in peacetime can be called upon to fight at any moment. Um, I'm not a fan of the moral equality of combatants. Um, so I believe that even many combatants are not, in fact, liable to be killed. Even many combatants on an un, in an unjust war on the unjust side are not liable to be killed. Um, but it seems to me it cannot be irre irrelevant whether those combatants are trying to kill me or not. Um, of course, I'm apparently justified in killing combatants on the other side, even when they're not trying to kill me. Sorry. Of course, this is the standard view, right? That I'm a, I, I can kill soldiers on the enemy side when they're sleeping, when they're in garrison, right? Um, so they don't actually have to be trying to kill me. But that's usually justified because they are part of the organization that is actively engaged in trying to harm me. Right? In this case, though, in a preventive war, that doesn't appear to be the case. The military is not the one engaging in the conspiracy. They seem, in, in the, the case of vision, much more like non-combatants. They may be complicit in the activities of their government to some extent, but not obviously to the extent that justifies their liability to attack. So my worry is precisely that um, in any war, you know, many of those killed and killed deliberately might not be liable to attack. But in a preventive war, it seems possible that almost none of those who are deliberately attacked will be liable to be attacked. Um, it looks like we've got, to a certain extent, the wrong target here. And that strikes me as a problem. So I'll stop there, and thank you very much. Thank you very much both for the, the, the paper and the, and the comments. Um, it's a lot to think about. And uh, uh, I'm going to begin, uh, like my co-commentator here, with just a, a brief summary. And maybe given the fire alarm, that's <coughs> useful. It's useful to hear it numerous times. And you can also tell me if I got it wrong. Um, Professor LeBond summarizes his theory of preventive war 
in a 2006 paper uh, in five key points. First, preventive war is distinct from preemptive war. The latter pertains to wars of self-defense, fought to preempt an imminent attack. His theory of preventive war is a restricted account that similarly places preventive wars in the category of wars fought out of self-defense. In order to get um, to this point, uh, Professor Levon uh, argues against a general rule permitting states confronting distant <coughs> or immature threats to launch, to launch preventive wars on the ground that such a permission would license too many wars, as we've heard. Preventive wars are rather justified only in responding to rogue states where the distant threat involves weapons of mass destruction and may be waged only by the actual target of the rogue states. Pre rogue states presumptive, presumptive, that's just too many S's, presumptive attack. Further, Professor Levon um, specifies that the threat of the rogue state must be a physical threat, not an instance, uh, for example, or not for instance, an, uh, an economic threat. Now, this theory of restrictive use of preventive war appropriately limits the justifiable use of war before an aggressive strike. His theory has been carefully developed, soundly criticized, um, even by some of the other uh, participants in our, in our conference this weekend, um, and, of course, ably or even brilliantly defended. It is more than a little intimidating, then, to attempt to provide a comment on such a theory. Uh, moreover, I should have mentioned that the approach that I take uh, in my comments this morning struck me at about five, uh, sorry, 4.45 this morning. Um, so it's safe to say that they are the very definition of half-baked. Um, and given the present hour, they really even haven't had time to, to leaven, to, for the yeast to rise. I hope then that you'll forgive me somewhat um, my doughy response. Okay, that's enough of the book. Um, uh, uh, as I attempt to think with Professor Lubon and explicate briefly another aspect of his preventive war theory that is articulated in his discussion of the example of the U.S. invasion on Iraq, but I think is or, or perhaps ought to be incorporated as a general principle in his restrictive account. Adding it, however, is not unproblematic, as I hope to show. Um, in his uh, discussion of the U.S. invasion of Iraq, Professor Levon um, emphasizes the importance of the U.S. intentions, um, a point of suspicion for others, saying that a great deal turns on the U.S. reconstruction of Iraq. As he explains, the United States must show that it is uh, everything it claims to be, an upholder of human rights, a supporter of Iraqi democracy, and a bulwark of the rule of law. Now, to be fair, he is here scrutinizing the U.S. preventive war doctrine uh, within the wider context of defending his own. Nonetheless, his point is a good one. Intentions in waging a preventive war are a chief means through which we uh, determine if a preventive attack is just. Professor Lubon's account allows only for the very restrictive principle of preventive wars against rogue states, where the distant threat involves weapons of mass destruction. But of course, that isn't the full story. Although uh, in a class of wars of self-defense, preventive action against a rogue state with the potential for weapons of mass destruction can uh, be a just, a can, uh, sorry, can't be just a one-time defensive action. Isn't the point to actually incapacitate the rogue state? If that's the case, then the ideology that sustains rogueness, if you will, um, uh, as well as the hostile intentions and weapons programs must be dismantled. Uh, that seems to commit the target state contemplating preventive action to significant post-bellum commitments. In this way, I want to suggest that preventive war is not uh, only connected with the just cause and the last resort, but also with right intent. Brian Oren uh, is, argues that, there, that the three parts of just war theory are connected. Um, use at bellum, use in bellow, and, and use post bellum. His point is to emphasize the decision to re that a decision to resort to war must include careful consideration of the post-conflict obligations as well. A war is not a just war, unless it also has a just peace. The rights and duties of the victor and the aggressor spelled out in the use post bellum principles uh, apply only when the victorious regime has fought a just and lawful war as defined by international law and just war theory. If preventive war is included in accounts of a just war, morally or legally, then post bellum considerations also enter as part of the equation or calculation to resort to preventive uh, attack uh, or as part of the right intent. The summary set of norms for a just termination of war consists, uh, according to Orant, of seven principles. And it's the last that I 
I'm particularly interested in, but I'll mention all seven here. The first is proportionality and publicity, that the peace settlement should be both measured and reasonable as well as publicly proclaimed. Uh, the second is rights vindication, that the, the settlement should secure the basic rights whose violation triggered the justified war. And certainly we can see that active in preventive war um, as well, or the, as uh, understanding or justifying uh, just preventive war as a just cause. Um, discrimination, that is the distinctions need to be made between the leaders, uh, the soldiers, and the civilians in the country one is negotiating with. Uh, two forms of punishment. One, when the defeated country has been a blatant rights violating aggressive, proportionate punishment must be meted out to the, especially those leaders who have instigated the uh, injustice. And then the second is that um, uh, military personnel who commit war crimes also ought to be uh, punished. Justice after war requires that, that uh, such actors on all sides of the conflict be accountable at trial. The sixth is compensation, that financial restitution may be mandated, uh, subject to both proportionality and discrimination, and or in seventh is rehabilitation. The post-war environment pr must provide a promising opportunity to reform decrepit institutions in the aggressor regime, proportional to the degree, to the degree of depravity in that regime. Now, I should say that I don't necessarily agree with all of Warren's um, uh, post bell principles here, uh, but I think his principle of rehabilitation gives us something to think about in light of preventive war. So that's my, my aim here. Warren means these principles, together with Yusa Adbalam and Yusin Balo, to be satisfied prior to engaging in political violence. This is significant. Our willingness to engage in a just war ought to include, or a preventive war, ought to include not only our willingness, but our obligation to ensure that the war ends justly. post bellum principles articulate that commitment, while also putting a limit on the rights of the victor in a just war. The post bellum criteria obligate the victor in a just war to ensure the vanquished, formerly the rogue state, develops as an upholder of human rights, a supporter of democracy, and a bulwark of the rule of law. Uh, the commitment to this principle of rehabilitation, to use Oren's term, must be established prior to advancing a preventive war. At least two issues then emerge that may prove problematic. And so, so partly what, I've, what I hope I've suggested there is that perhaps implicit in Professor Luban's account is this commitment to um, establishing post-war conditions where the weapons of mass destruction program ceases. It's not just stopping the... the uh, probabilistic attack, but that the, the program itself is, uh, or the threat itself, the rogue state, is no longer um, a threat. So uh, so this, uh, I suggest, it, uh, can be addressed through this principle of rehabilitation, and that might be part of a, a restrictive economic preventive war, but there are some concerns. And the first is that a commitment to establish and sustain a formerly rogue state as an upholder of human rights, democracy, and the rule of law must be a credible commitment. Credibility in this case, I think, means that the domestic support for a long-term military and financial uh, commitment to the rogue state, sorry, bad sense. Credibility in the sense means that we have to be, that, that the, the nation responding has to be committed to it, um, and a long-term commitment, both militarily and financially. That requires at least two things. It requires the support of the people in the domestic si situation, and there, obviously, I'm presuming a democracy, but it may not be the case. Uh, long-term political and social commitment that is at least difficult to secure. In a good situation, such involvement would be a 15 to 20 year commitment. Second, um, only the target of the rogue state is justifiably the defender who launches a preventive attack, as we've heard in the second set of comments. First set of comments. It is the threatened or the target of the rogue state then that I'm suggesting must make the postbellum commitment as part of right intention prior to launching a preventive attack. Both theoretically and practically, that may be problematic. Theoretically, and connected with the next issue that I discuss, establishing regimes that uphold human rights requires the full cooperation of the international community. Practically, threatened nations may not be, and often have not been, in any sort of position to help rebuild, in a more just form, a rogue state that has threatened them with mass destruction. Threatened nations are often targeted because they are or appear weak, militarily or financially. They, are, they might be former colonies or parts of the rogue state itself, and I had Crimea in mind um, with that. And hence the suffering from the unstable effects of that former relation. Or 
they might themselves not be what we might call a paragon of human rights defense, that there might be actual problems in that um, nation that has been targeted. Okay, so the next uh, issue for a restrictive account of preventive war that includes postbellum principles, or at least the extension of right intention in post-war establishment of a just social order, is the taint of imperialism. Professor Lubon understands a rogue state to be a state that shows contempt for the rule of law through specific violations of rules against armed attack or state-sponsored terrorism. And, and he further argues, or shows, uh, by the way, that on this account, the US could conceivably be suspected of veering toward rogue status. The intention of a preventive attack is not just to stop a rogue state from using weapons of mass destruction, but to transform the rogue state, such that its ideology, hostile intentions, and weapons programs no longer lend themselves to rogueness. Sorry. Uh, that transformation, it seems to me, and moreover the commitment to carry through with that transformation in the justifications for preventive attack prior to its launch, starts to echo some of the concerns about the spread of imperialism that opponents to the Iraq invasion and preventive attacks more generally present. So just, just a hint, a taint there. So I'm sure that I say here nothing uh, terribly new, but I hope that it will at least give us some fodder for discussion as we begin uh, this exciting and important conference on the ethics of war. three of our speakers this morning. Um, I think this is an excellent beginning, and so I don't want to take much time um, since it's just limited. I want to open this now for question and answer, um, and certainly I, I invite the three of you to, to speak directly to one another as well. I'm going to bring this mic over, and you can. Uh, I'd ask for questioners to identify yourself and if you wish your affiliation, and maybe to stand so all can hear. Yes. I'm a applied physics professor from Penn State University. Another question for Dr. Lubin. And the question is the following, is that uh, you indicated that, um, that we can view things occasionally as an expectation value, the results, the, the decision to, the, 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 the way of making a decision, looking at it as an expectation value. And that's a probability multiplied by the expected payoff, as you have indicated. And but to the end, you indicated that uh, we don't have the numbers, or the probabilities, or whatever. And that's why I'm concerned about it. Because isn't it true that the numbers have as their source, very often, the viscera? And that is what I'd like you to comment on, because that's what controls the issue, the numbers on which they base their decision. And if it comes from the viscera, then it might as well have come from me. It yeah. comes from the victor? The viscera. But from the viscera, sorry. The viscera, they have a visceral source yeah. of the politician who's pushing the, the, the issue. And that the world has all this uh, people, and that's the case. Um, can, can everybody hear me without the microphone? Or that's it? Okay. Yeah, um, I don't, uh, when I talk about the expectation value and your probability and payoff, that's quantitative and mathematical language for something that I don't think can actually be quantified. This is more analogical. Uh, so this actually goes to the question about the sense to which I'm a utilitarian. I think utilitarianism uh, uh, depends on a notion of calculating the future. And I don't actually believe that we're in a position to calculate the future. So what I think would be the best way of understanding this is that we're not talking about numbers, but we're talking about things that are kind of ballpark. Uh, so we know, I mean, we, we can't actually assign a number to uh, uh, what the damage of, uh, let's take the example of somebody releasing weaponized anthrax and causing an epidemic, actually. I, maybe let's take smallpox. I don't think anthrax is communicable in the same way. Uh, so what we think is that would be really, really a big magnitude event. 
as opposed to somebody setting off a bomb in a mailbox, which could be a terrible thing, or a car bomb on the street. It's nevertheless a fairly small magnitude event. And I'm, th I'm thinking, both in terms of probabilities and in payoffs, that we should only be acting when we can say, that one's really big. This is pretty significant, but we're never going to actually be able to assign numbers. Now, in a way, I'm agreeing with the half of the, the sentiment beside, behind this is visceral, because I'm saying that we're just going to be taking wild stabs at the future. Uh, the half that I'm not agreeing with is that the stabs can be made less wild. I mean, even if we don't really need uh, a number to know that a smallpox epidemic is something that, uh, that we, we don't want even one of, that a nuclear device being set off in a city is something that we don't want even one of. So when we're talking about um, quantities that actually change into qualities, then I don't think we really need numbers. And then we should, I mean, you're right to call me on this. Uh, don't think about this the way that an engineer or a decision theorist would, um, that we're actually going to assign very precise numbers and multiply them out. That's never going to happen. Or if it does, that's because somebody um, has a misplaced faith in their own quantitative expertise. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, in the back there. Oh, <laughs> sorry. No. sorry, behind you, and then, then you can go ahead, Joe. Yes. Good morning. Um, my name is Stephen Pike. I'm a Illinois ROTC student. My question is actually a little less focused on the contemporary conflict you're talking about with ground war, and more towards the economic war that we see countries use currently, especially in the latter half of the 90s, uh, latter half of the 90s and the 2000s. We see that with our economic sanctions against Ukraine, uh, against Ukrainian and Russian leaders. We see that with Iran and their nuclear program. So I was wondering how these um, ethics that you're talking about with just war theory, how do they apply towards the Western cultures when they go to a conflict? And it's not a conflict of actual ground war, but a conflict of economies. And should these just war theories actually be applied to how we do it and how we actually go to war with uh, sanctions and uh, economics? Yeah. Uh, now, yeah, I would invite both of you to comment on this as well. Uh, to me, the, the use of sanctions just doesn't raise the same kind of moral issues because it doesn't, uh, I don't think that uh, sanctions against oligarchs are violating anybody's fundamental rights. Uh, one, of the, one of the major reasons why we even think about just war theory is that when we, um, whenever we're talking about going kinetic or something that's really close, like certain kinds of cyber attacks, then we're talking about uh, uh, things that look like violations of the most basic rights that people have. And uh, those, I think, raise distinct moral issues. And all of just war theory has been about this perception that there's something really different about physical violence than other things. And uh, uh, yeah, I think your question, should we even be thinking about economic sanctions in terms of just war theory? My answer would be no. That we can think about it in terms not of the, the theory of what goes on in war, but um, what goes on in rule of law regimes. That uh, economic sanctions, you can see maybe those are violations of property rights. Maybe there ought to be regulations, like banking regulations, on the kind of sanctions that can be imposed so that there's principles of justice that apply to economic sanctions. But I think those will be just very different sets of issues. So I mean, they're more like I think of as lawyer issues than issues of uh, use ad bellum or use in bellum. But, uh, um, yeah. but it's actually a subject that I haven't devoted much thought to, so that's just an off-the-cuff response, and I, I could be con convinced otherwise. May I just make a, a self-serving analogy here? Um, I'm sure Professor Luben will agree with me that, of course, there are, there are many ethical considerations having to do with sanctions. And one of them strikes me as roughly similar to the, the worry I was trying to enunciate at the end. Depending on the sanctions, they can, unfortunately, tend to fall hardest on those people who are least responsible for for the 
the offense, whatever it is, right? So we so we impose you know economic sanctions on Iran, and it's and it's you know the, the person in the street who ends up going hungry. It's it's very difficult in a way to, to target your sanctions precisely enough. Right. Right. And I would just add to that that it, we have seen in the history, and, and it's certainly possible. To bring sanctions in a way that actually violates the basic human rights of the people uh, upon whom they are imposed. Yeah. And in that case, um, I think we have a real serious question to ask ourselves whether it would actually be more just to go to war against the, the state as a military uh, target rather than uh, to put so many innocent people's lives at risk um, through economic sanctions. So, uh, but I, uh, you said something about framing sanctions in terms of justice. I think that's the, the right way. If the sanctions hit the the unjust oligarch, I don't see. A, I, I think they are a preferable route. Certainly, it's one we should pursue before the last resort. But if they are targeting the poor and most vulnerable in society, then we have to question. Yeah, that is a really important distinction. I think that that's the way in which there's been some ethical learning about sanctions. Uh, it, before the Iraq war, when there were economic sanctions against Iraq, it was pretty clear that they were hitting the, the man, woman, and child in the street the hardest. And they weren't doing anything to dislodge the regime. And the whole idea behind smart sanctions is that the person that you want to sanction is the person who bears some kind of responsibility for the situation. And so the kind of sanctions that we have imposed, that our allies have imposed against, against Russia, which uh, the Russians are kind of laughing it off, are sanctions saying, this bank, this member of the Duma, uh, this oligarch, you know, who are all Ukraine saber rattlers, uh, guess what? Now you can't go and park another $10 million um, in a nice flat in Islington in London. I mean, the Brits won't go along with that because all of London is kept afloat by oligarch money, but that's a good thing. <laughs> we have limited time, so if I could ask folks to make their questions very brief. You can go ahead, and then we had one over here. Um, I thought Dr. Scholz's point strongly refuted your position. That is, the preventive war doctrine that you espouse led to the terrible post-war state in Iraq. It could not be said that we won. It could not be said we brought about justice. Could not be said we brought about anything good out of that. Also, you seem to violate the domestic analogy that Walzer uses. What you argue for is not anything like my notion of self-defense against my neighbor. I thought you confused, sir, preventive war with drone strikes in Yemen, which kill one person, ideally one person, which doesn't seem to be war to me. And lastly. I hope at Georgetown there is someone appointed who opposes the Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld doctrine of preventive war. I was worried about free speech there, unless the devil's advocate on the other side of you and in the other military academies also has an appointment like yours. Okay, well, starting with the last, I'm the only person at Georgetown who supports. I mean, I won't vouch for all the people in security studies on the main campus, but at the law school, people think that I'm crazy. Uh, so uh, let me first, taking the points very quickly, I completely agree uh, with your comment and yours. One of the just war criteria is right intention. Part of the measure of right intention is what happens post bellum Now, here with Iraq, we're talking about one particular kind of preventive war, which is a war of regime change. Matters, I think, would be very different if there were no occupation or takeover, if there was a limited military preventive strike, uh, and then you know, the regime in that country, in the target country, just kept on as before. But in this case, I agree completely. We, um, I, I mean, we could go on for hours about how how bad our post-war plan was because we didn't have one, and our national leadership actually fired all of the people who knew anything about Iraq who were in the State Department because they all thought that Ahmad Chalabi would be a terrible choice and the civilians in the Defense Department wanted to make Ahmad Chalabi the 
the leader of post-war in Iraq. So uh, uh, I completely agree that we blew that, but I, uh, and therefore I, I accept that point. Now as to the domestic analogy, I mean, this would be a, a longer discussion, but I essentially don't believe in the domestic analogy. I just don't think that states are like people in any kind of uh, um, interesting way. And in fact, I think that one of the ways in which I probably see the world differently than uh, two of our speakers tomorrow, uh, Jeff McMahon and David Roden, is that they very much want to model questions of national self-defense on the domestic analogy and self-defense by individuals in, uh, let's say, in a harsh urban setting. And I simply don't think we're going to get much mileage from that because a state isn't doesn't look like an individual. If you look at uh, the frontispiece of Hobbes' Leviathan, where he has a picture of the sovereign as actually being one gigantic human body made of the body of all of its people, uh, that's, I think, illusion. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Professor, my question is for you. Um, my name is Billy White. From uh, I'm a senior at Military Academy. Can you clarify further your criteria of mass casualties of a narrowly tailored preventative attack in that why is loss of territory not considered in the criteria, given that it seems fair to say that the likelihood of Crimea annexation was high even before President Putin actually committed to doing so? Yeah. Uh, I think that part of it is because I, you know, since war involves violence, I want to, my own view of use on Bellum more generally, is that we ought to key it to violations of basic human rights. And uh, basic human rights, this is a kind of a term of art uh, that was devised by the philosopher Henry Hsu, is those human rights, the enjoyment of which is necessary to any other rights at all. So that's physical security, that's economic subsistence, and that's certain categories of political rights where if you don't have them, you won't be in a position to enjoy any other rights at all. Um, and uh, I don't think the territory, the loss of territory, falls into the category of basic human rights, uh, unless we're talking about something like expulsion from one's home. Uh, now, you know, the Crimea case is really complicated because you know, we know that the referendum in which the Crimeans supposedly said, we actually don't want to be part of Ukraine, we'd rather be part of Russia, you know, was done under, under duress and got a 97% vote. But I haven't heard anybody doubt that if there had been no duress, it still would have gotten a majority vote. And uh, I think that that makes matters more complicated. I mean, if, because I, I don't think that we can see this in Cold War terms that who gets Crimea is the West versus Russia. Maybe the people who live in Crimea should get to decide which government they want to be part of. And we have time for maybe one, maybe two. We'll see. Yes, you there. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Cadet Wombacher. I'm from the military academy. Uh, my question was about uh, drone strikes. You mentioned a little bit at the beginning about um, how I, I, what, I, what I pulled from was that you did not approve of the drone policy being used in uh, Pakistan and uh, Afghanistan because you considered it preemptive. Is that correct? Some of the attacks be preemptive? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not. Um, they actually. It's qualified, yes, so maybe you should finish your question first and then I'll explain sure. what I mean. Um, and, yeah. and, I, and I guess my, my confusion was, and uh, Dr. Uh, we call him Sir Richard, but Dr. Richard <laughs> Hogan, uh, brought up the, uh, um, the idea that, that soldiers are not necessarily um, engageable because they're holding a rifle, but you know, because they're engaged in harm. Uh, and, and Walter, uh, his first principle is uh, that once war has begun, um, the soldier is engageable at any time. Um, so I guess my question is, if you don't think that um, a combatant can be engaged or, or, a, or someone, someone in a scope can be engaged uh, at any time because it's preventive and I have to wait until he picks up his weapon, um, is it, is it then allowable to engage him if I know he's a member of, say, Al-Qaeda or some other terrorist organization? Yeah. 
Um, so here's uh, my thought about the drones. Uh, first of all, to start by distinguishing the use of drones in hot theaters of war, let's say Afghanistan, from the use of drones in, let's say, Somalia um, or Yemen. I mean, we say that we are in a conflict with Al-Qaeda and associated forces. One awkward fact is that um, we, the information about who the associated forces with is classified. Um, I, I think a unique situation in US history where we are engaged in a war and the identity of the adversary has to be kept secret from the American people. Uh, now, um, let's just focus on, say, Somalia, where we're pretty sure, I mean, there, there it's not a secret. I mean, the adversary is al-Shabaab. Now, al-Shabaab, as far as I know, isn't planning attacks against uh, the U.S. homeland. So these are in the form of anticipatory attacks. And the way that we have uh, described the policy is to say that we only target those who are posing an imminent threat. Now that sounds like the old preemptive, not preventive, rationale. You look more closely at the definition of imminent, and anybody who is a major operative in al-Qaeda and associated forces is defined as an imminent threat. So even if they actually aren't planning something right now, we still count them as an imminent threat. Uh, so I think that we've kind of obfuscated about whether we're engaged in a preemptive rationale or a preventive rationale. Now, when we're not actually involved in combat with the country, when we're not in an armed conflict with Somalia, we're not in an armed conflict with Yemen, then I think that uh, this is one place where we can learn something from the domestic situation. Uh, when are police allowed to engage in the use of lethal force uh, the answer is when there's no possibility of doing anything else. Um, there, there's an imminence where the example that I used during the talk of a hostage taker, where um, the danger is imminent and there's nothing else you can do. There's no due process. You don't go to a judge. You don't say, well, let's get some evidence here. You have the snipers and they take their, their clear shot. When they get it, something like that I think ought to be the criterion when we're using a targeted strike in a country that we're not at war with. So if this planner, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a, a conception of imminence. If this uh, Al-Qaeda and associated forces or Al-Shabaab leader is actually planning a strike, then that justifies the lethal use of force, if it's just that we think that, well, someday we might, or someday they will, that, to me, doesn't constitute a significant enough threat. And particularly, if you throw in my other criteria, that they have to be threatening to cause mass casualties. And I don't think that uh, these uh, 17-year-old farmers who are taking up arms for Al-Shabaab, even if they get trained up as another shoe bomber, they're not, it's not a threat of the kind of magnitude that allows that kind of boundary crossing. So that was my kind of I do and I don't. I mean, what I object to isn't the use of drones uh, as, as a matter of labeling. I really object to calling it the use of drones against imminent threats because they just aren't imminent. And it seems to me that in countries where we're not actually involved in an armed conflict, that we ought to be using something more like the civilian criterion of imminence. <laughs> and well, unfortunately, we're going to have to cut this session off. I know we have lots to talk about, but we need to give ourselves a break and um, come back. And I hope that will be closer to 10 minutes. That's what I was going to say. Yes. Is it, let's thank all of our speakers for an excellent beginning.